President. Republican Leader. I just want to uh, reiterate the point that the Majority Leader just made, that he's anticipating us being in on the weekends, and to underscore um, why that seems to be necessary is because the majority is intent on passing this health care bill that the Americans oppose, American people oppose. We know that from all of the surveys. And in addition to that, there are a number of things that actually must be done this week, uh, this month. We have a, a debt ceiling um, e expiring or needing to be expanded, according to the administration. We've not passed uh, appropriation bills. There are tax extenders that ex expire at the end of the year. There are Patriot Act provisions uh, that expire at the end of the year. Mr. President, there are many things we must do this month, and yet we're going to spend an enormous amount of time working on a, on a bill that the American people wish we would not pass uh, this month. Let me just say, first, I want to welcome everybody back, uh, senators and staff, after what hopefully was a restful and uh, happy Thanksgiving. I had a chance, I actually worked um, Monday and Tuesday of last week, had a chance to spend a good deal of time out in my state of Kentucky with a number of folks. And I must tell you, Mr. President, nobody was shy about telling me what they thought about the health care bill. Nobody was shy about it. Uh, they had uh, obviously been paying a lot of attention to it. Many had focused on the uh, vote to proceed to this 2074-page uh, uh, bill Saturday a week ago. Uh, many people have an opinion, and so far, Mr. President, not a single solitary Kentuckian that I've run into, admittedly, this is anecdotal, but not a single solitary one has said anything other than you've got to stop that health care bill. And I assured them we were going to do the very best we could to either uh, dramatically change it by amendment or hopefully on a bipartisan basis uh, keep this uh, 2074 page bill from passing. A lot of people I met uh, had that kind of an observation. I expect it's uh, pretty similar across the country. Kentuckians want to know how spending trillions of dollars we don't have on a plan that raises health insurance premiums and taxes on families and small businesses is good for health care or for jobs or for the economy, for that matter. The fact is, Americans feel like they've been taken for a ride in this debate. And they're beginning to realize what administration officials meant when they said that a crisis was a terrible thing to waste. Early this year, they said a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. The notion that we would even consider spending trillions of dollars we don't have in a way that a majority of Americans don't even want is proof that this health care bill is completely and totally out of touch with the American people. It's now perfectly clear what happened. The administration and its allies in Congress have wanted to push government-run health care for many years, and they view the economic crisis that we're in as their moment to do it. So they sold their plan as an anecdote to the recession, even though their plan would only make things worse. But now Americans are beginning to see the truth behind the rhetoric. No one believes, no one, that trillions in spending, taxes, and debt will do anything but kill jobs and darken the economic prospects of struggling Americans and their children. The administration's health care plan won't alleviate the situation we're in. Instead, it would punish struggling Americans at a moment when all they want is a little help. Proponents of this bill couch their efforts with the refrain that history is calling. How often have we heard that, Mr. President? History is calling. I think they've got it half right. Someone's calling, all right, but it's not history. It's the American worker. He's wondering where the jobs are. It's the middle class family wondering how Congress could try to pass a scheme that won't do anything to control costs. It's one of the roughly 40 million seniors wondering when Medicare became a piggy bank to fund more, more government and higher premiums. 
I've enumerated the specifics about the Medicare cuts in this bill before. Nearly $135 billion in cuts to hospitals. $135 billion in cuts to hospitals. $120 billion in cuts to Medicare Advantage. Nearly $15 billion in cuts to nursing homes. And Mr. President, if that were not enough, $8 billion in cuts to hospices. Hospices. Nearly half a trillion dollars in cuts. This is what some have audaciously referred to as, quote, saving Medicare, end quote. A half a trillion dollars in cuts referred to as, quote, saving Medicare. Well, I don't know what's more preposterous, saying that this plan saves Medicare or thinking that people will actually believe that. Arthur Dearson gets it. He's a constituent of mine from Versailles, Kentucky. Here's what he had to say about this plan. He wrote, quote, I agree that there are some things in the health care system that need to be fixed or improved. But let's work on the most important five or six issues rather than turn the whole system upside down and run up the cost for all of us and take away from us seniors. Now, Mr. Dearsing knows what he's talking about. He knows this bill doesn't reflect the views of the American people. Americans have been asking us to cut costs, not raise them. They want the kinds of step-by-step -step reforms that would actually make a difference without bankrupting the country and without further expanding the role of government in their lives. Americans don't want this bill to pass. They do not want it to pass. All the surveys indicate that. Instead, they want us to earn their trust with the kind of common sense reforms Republicans have been talking about all year and which our friends on the other side have simply brushed aside. Americans want us to end junk lawsuits against doctors and hospitals that drive up costs. And yet there's not a serious word about doing so in the 2,074 pages in this Democrat bill. Americans want us to encourage healthy choices like prevention and wellness programs. And yet Democratic leaders couldn't come up with a serious word about these kinds of reforms in 2,074 pages. Americans want us to lower costs by letting consumers buy coverage across state lines. They want us to let small businesses band together to negotiate lower insurance rates. And yet Democrats have ignored both of these ideas despite having the opportunity, certainly, in 2,074 pages to include such ideas. Americans also want us to address the rampant waste, fraud, and abuse in the current system before we create an entirely new government program. And yet Democrats don't seriously confront this problem in their 2074-page monument, monument to more government, more taxes, more spending, and more debt. Americans are fed up with big government solutions that drive up taxes and drive up debt, and which only seem to create more problems, more abuse, and more fraud. In face of this, our friends on the other side of the aisle appear determined to plow ahead with their plans. They don't seem to care that Americans are telling them to stop, to stop this, and to start over and fix the problem, which is health care costs. Democratic leaders may think that they hear history calling. But the sounds they should be hearing are the voices and the concerns of ordinary Americans. The American people will be heard in this debate, I assure you. In a democracy, public opinion should not be, and never is, irrelevant. Now, Mr. President, at the beginning